Ladies and gentlemen, it is September 8th, 2022. Queen Elizabeth II just died, so we're gonna talk about the skunk ape. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lodge. No stranger to crossing the Florida-Georgia line and making its sweet home in Alabama, the skunk ape is kind of the Sasquatch of the South, you might say. But while it is associated with multiple southern U.S. states, it really does make its home in the Everglades. And of course, the Everglades are home to a national park. Now, the skunk ape was allegedly first reported in Florida newspapers in 1818, specifically the, and I'm not even making this up because Florida can't have normal names for anything, Apalachicola, Florida. Apalachicola, actually. Now, despite searching the entirety of the internet, JSTOR, and my local library, I could not find a single one of these newspapers from Apalachicola from 1818. But, according to the internet and Wikipedia, which has possibly the most citations needed uh, little markers on any Wikipedia page I've ever seen, the skunk ape was described as being a man-sized monkey. Now, this would not be too odd, there are monkeys in Florida, but they're typically not the size of a human being. But this 1818 Apalachicola man monkey was reportedly raiding food stores and also stalking fishermen along the banks of various rivers and creeks. I was able to start finding documentation from 1977, so obviously there's a pretty good distance here, but what I could find was that there was a uh, southernmost skunk ape society, and they claimed to have found a trove of documents in a member's attic, which gave all sorts of evidence for sightings of the skunk ape. Now, these documents do claim that skunk ape sightings date back to the 16th century, which would be the beginning of Spanish settlement in the region, so I'm a little, a little not sure about that one. But the most recent available accounts that I could find, and again, not in their original form, this was all typed up, this was all the reporting from the Southernmost Skunk Ape Society, the earliest one I could find dates to 1929. And I have, as such, dubbed this the Perky Bat Tower Incident of 1929. Clyde Perky, seeking to do something about the mosquito problem nearby, which is something I'm sure many Floridians can agree with, decided that the best way to handle that was to build a large tower and fill it with bats. Who gave him this idea? Some doctor in Texas. So he ordered all of the lumber and he built himself this rather large tower. I think it's still standing. I'll see if we can find a picture of it for this video. But he builds himself a nice tower and then decides, you know what? You know how we're going to get the bats in the tower? We're going to put bat poop in it. Guano for the scientists out there. Now, for the first three days that the guano was in the finished tower, no bats came. But Clyde didn't want to wait for any bats to show up. No, Clyde was a man of action, a man of purpose. So he ordered his own bats and put them in the tower and they didn't stay. They left. Uh, three days later, however, upon realizing, I guess, that there were no local caves and this tower would do just fine, the bats returned and they nested in there for the night before on the fourth day they decided to go out hunting. Now, uh, the locals, and by the locals I mean the skunk ape, did not take kindly to this, and according to Clyde, he witnessed a eight-foot-tall, very hairy humanoid walk out and shake the bat tower so violently that the bats just left. Now, it is absolutely possible that the skunk ape emerged from the woods, shook this bat tower, and scared the bats off. It's also possible that Clyde Perky's idea of building a bat tower and filling it with bats that decided not to stay there was embarrassing and a waste of money and he made up this story as a way to avoid being mocked around town. I will let you decide which you think is more likely on that one. Next up we have the Sewanee County Skunk Ape Car Chase of 1942 wherein an unnamed driver reported a large, hairy humanoid charging his car, grabbing onto it, and pulling a Fast and Furious for a mile and a half while he drove at the whopping speed of 15 miles an hour. But it didn't stop there. The skunk ape continued to show up, and in 1947, we got the Barden Booger Incidents. A number of people from the town of Barden reported seeing something resembling the skunk ape as it was reported in the previous two stories, including one woman who claimed that while she was out for a leisurely horse ride in the wilderness, a 10-foot tall ape man just kind of poked its head out of the woods, looked at her, waved and said hello, and she decided to ride off into the distance. But much like the years, the skunk ape starts coming and it don't stop coming. And in 1963, we got yet another incident, one that I like to refer to as the unexpected skunk guest of 1963. 
This one occurred on the Ormond Lee Estate near Gainesville, Florida, where a 12-year-old girl, while on a jog over to the neighbor's house, reported seeing a 7-foot, 6-inch tall, hairy humanoid just kind of standing off at the tree line and watching her as she jogged. She made it to her friend's house and decided, you know what, I should report this in 2013. She submitted her story to the Bigfoot Research Organization, who, as you would expect, took her entire story at face value and published it as truth. And how detailed was her description? Extraordinarily. This was a seven and a half foot tall, very hairy man with dark eyes. Just seven years later, we had the Sasquatch shootout of 1970. Palm Beach Sheriff's deputies Marvin Lewis and Ernie Davis reported seeing what they believed to be the skunk ape. Now, terrified of it, they fired a couple of shots, and it ran off into the distance. But not to be deterred by the creature running away, they chased after it before finding that it had trampled over a barbed wire fence. They claimed that the creature had been stalking them, but that does not totally explain why they decided to chase it or how it knocked over the fence, but, you know, it's an old story. Now we come to the Broward Bigfoot sightings of 1971. Now, if you look on Wikipedia, it's gonna tell you that there were a smattering of sightings from 1971 to 1975, but if you go and you actually read the reports in the newspapers and all of that, there were like two sightings in 1971 that were reported 18 different times by various newspapers, but I'm gonna go through some of them for you. A 1971 article in the Boca Raton News recorded a man who called in to the police asking if there were any orangutans loose in the Everglades. Now, he was asking this question because his daughter had come to him and mentioned seeing something that appeared to be an orangutan, a reddish-gray ape, that was bigger than daddy. An additional article about the same instance in the St. Petersburg Independent reported that a 15-man posse, presumably including Daddy himself, went and chased after the orangutan, and what they found were 12 to 14-inch footprints that were spaced about four feet apart per step with knuckle imprints on the ground between them. So, uh, whatever creature they were chasing appears to have been the type to uh, use its knuckles for movement. Now, that doesn't really track with Bigfoot, so are we dealing with the same thing? Or perhaps there was an orangutan loose in the Everglades. It's kind of a wild place down there. And while they did find traces and tracks, none of the adults actually saw the creature firsthand. It had only been described to them by their children. A different article, this time in the Ocala Banner Star, Florida, you're killing it with the names here, reported that a woman had seen a five foot grayish colored one as well as a two foot tall juvenile and that they had gotten so close that the toddler version of the skunk ape was actually able to claw at her ankle. Now, she did actually give us another piece of information here. In this version of the story, we get the smell of the skunk ape, and it is described as smelling like skunk cabbage, a plant native to the American South. There's also something else that smells like skunk and looks like cabbage that she may be under the influence of, but we won't talk about that on YouTube. And after these stories in 1971, there's a bit of a gap. There are still sightings here and there, but in terms of recorded, documented cases, we kind of get this, this little lapse until 1997, where I, I begin to say that the modern skunk ape takes form. Now, in 1997, wilderness tour guides in the Everglades had started using the skunk ape as kind of a spooky story and a way to keep people interested in the, the tours that they were giving. So, they started to report sightings of them, and then those sightings started to multiply. Basically, whenever a tour guide would say, and here we have the skunk ape, seven to ten people would see a skunk ape. Not very hard to look at the power of suggestion here on this one. And if you've noticed, I'm being quite a bit more skeptical about this story than I usually am, because a lot of it just seems like hoaxes. Uh, it makes Bigfoot seem like something with a large body of evidence behind it. So, you know. I'm not saying that Bigfoot researchers are always absolute nut jobs, but there are quite a few of them, and I watched a whole bunch of like skunk ape believers on YouTube before this, and it just, a lot of it comes across as a gimmick and people trying to make money off of local legend. So I'm a little bit, you know, you know how I am about exploiting folk tales and fantasizing about them. Like, uh, obviously I talk all the time about how much I hate what pop culture has turned the Wendigo into. So yeah, this just, this just kind of bugs me. I don't like when people do this kind of thing, you know? But as I was saying, in 1997, tour guide David Shealy reported seeing raided, and I'm not joking when I say this, raided lima bean bait traps, where I guess they would stick a bunch of lima beans to bait wildlife, and it was weird that one of them had been eaten, which is the whole point, but regardless, he said that there were tracks, and that the tracks were strange, and then, lo and behold, he goes and he sets up more lima bean bait traps, and what do you know? 
Local wildlife ate them, and there were more strange tracks, and then a whole bunch of people reported seeing the skunk ape. Now, two gentlemen with utterly incomprehensible names, Gow Roland and Steve Goodbread, also had a sighting in 1997, and they defended their sighting by saying, it can't be a hoax, it was very humid today and it was 100 degrees, which seems like exactly the kind of thing you would say if you had planned a hoax. Also in 1997, Ochopee, Florida, for the love of God, the names. Ochopee Fire Control District Chief Vince Dewar claimed to have photographed the skunk ape, but I can't find the photograph, so unfortunately that is as far as this story goes. But there is a photograph that works for this, and it was sent in to the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office, and the woman who sent it was an elderly woman who said she believed it to be an orangutan. Now, the picture is clearly right next to my head, so you can decide for yourself if that's an orangutan. Um, it kind of looks exactly like a picture from one of the 90s issues of Ripley's Believe It or Not, but color corrected to be a skunk ape. Um, you know, if I can find the Ripley's one, it'll also be right next to my head, but that's really more of a post-process thing. We'll see how it goes. But that's kind of where the documented skunk ape stuff stops. Everything since then feels very gimmicky, very, um, you know, n not even National Geographic. It just feels very like History Channel, you know, where they're trying to be sensational and, you know, get you to view it. It, it very much feels like the, what they do with ancient aliens, where they take little tidbits of evidence and surround it with enough somewhat believable stuff and expert knowledge that you start to buy into it which I will admit at a certain point, I did kind of look at ancient aliens and go, you know, they make some good points. And then they got some stuff horribly wrong about the medieval period and it caused me to question the rest of it. But where I do look to find truth when it comes to stories like this is not to the American newspapers, it's not to the folklorists of the European variety, but rather I look to the indigenous folklore because they had stories before we got here. And... Those stories, therefore, uh, can be relied upon a little bit more and seen as actually experiential rather than a lot of these European stories where they get here, they see a Native American folklore item or creature and spin it into a tale that's going to do well in the press. And there are two specific ones that work for the region and the behavior. And those are the Cherokee Devil, or, and I am so, so, so sorry if I butcher this pronunciation, uh, Tsulkalu who is, uh, the, the name Sulkalu means uh, slant-eyed giant. So there's two stories here. And now, of course, I've read versions of the Cherokee Devil story where it's a very violent creature that looks like a Bigfoot and uh, attacks people, primarily Cherokee people. But the version I got going to an actual First Nations website was a lot less violent and uh, animalistic. It was much more of a, um, I, I want to use the term like, evolutionary cousin sort of idea. And I'll give you the gist of the story here. Basically, there is a young woman who wants to marry, but her family will only allow her to marry a great hunter. So one night as she's sleeping outside in a building that I guess is an outdoor area that um, Cherokee people had built. Uh, I, I don't totally understand a lot of the terminology here, but she was sleeping in a little outdoor enclosure and her mother is sleeping inside the house. So one night, the, this creature, Sulkalu, comes out and, you know, presents himself to her and talks to her and wishes to court her. And she says, well, I can only marry a great hunter. And he says, well, I am a great hunter. And he goes out that night and he brings her back a deer. And she says, wow, you are a great hunter. And she shows the deer to her mom. And her mom's like, this is great. And the next day, the, uh, the great hunter brings back two deer. And the mother is like, this is so great, but it would be really nice if he brought us some firewood. So, Tsukalu doing as he has asked, because, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this, uh, he can read minds. So, Tsukalu can read minds, and he mind reads the request for uh, more deer and for firewood, and he brings a couple of trees. The mother is not pleased about the tree issue, and she makes this known to her daughter, but Tsukalu is listening, and he hears this, and he's like, all right, I'll take my trees, and you ain't got no wood. But he's not mad at the, the young woman, he's mad at her mother. So he continues to bring the young woman gifts, but he, he always is gone by daylight. Now, the mother, at a certain juncture, wants to actually meet Tsukalu. And this is sensible when you think about it. 
But Sulkalu says to the young woman, I can't show myself to your mother. She'll be very frightened of me. And he's a, he's a little self-conscious about his appearance. So, you know, you, you get it. And so she, she goes to her mom and she says, you can meet him, you can see him. But Sulkalu is a little self-conscious about his appearance, which is okay. So the young woman goes to her mother and she says, you can meet my boyfriend, but you've got to promise me that you're not going to scream and wail about him being kind of scary looking. And the mom's like, yeah, I got this. I've seen men before. But of course, Suakalu stays till daylight and reveals himself to the mother. And she immediately screams, ah, oh my God, a terrifying beast and runs away. Suakalu's feelings are hurt. And he decides that, you know what? He's never showing himself to the mom again. Now, there's a lot more to the story, but the gist of the story is that they have a child together who starts life as a worm and then grows into a human baby, and then at some point there's a second human baby. There are some details left out of the story. I'm trying to find a more detailed version, but currently I have yet to do so. And she, the, the young woman and Suwakalu go off to his homeland, which is far in the west. And eventually her brother decides he wants to meet the baby, and he goes out to meet the baby, but Suwakalu won't reveal himself, so he meets the kids, but he doesn't meet the, the husband himself. And finally, after enough begging and pleading, Tsukalu uh, agrees that he will go and he will meet the brother and his village and the mother and all of that. But there are conditions. They must fast for seven days, and when he approaches, he's going to give them new clothes to wear so that they can meet him in his presence, and they absolutely must not give the war whoop. Now, you can already see where this story is going, because when can humans ever actually do what some supernatural being tells them to do? So, of course, uh, a man from a local village who wants to see Suakalu uh, comes by, but he doesn't really want to do the fasting thing, and so he sneaks out every night to go eat. And then also, when Suakalu finally approaches and they hear the mighty sound of his, you know, great feet and his trembling roar and all of that, uh, he runs outside, does the war whoop because he's scared, and then runs away into the woods. So Suakalu sends his wife forward and she says, you can't meet him, you know, you guys broke the rules, and so Kalu never reveals himself to people ever again. So this is the creature known by some as the Cherokee Devil, but Cherokee Devil seems to really be kind of putting a negative light onto something that I don't totally read as negative. It also tracks a lot more with the Western Sasquatch, that we're talking about a great supernatural being, a protector of the forest, a lord of game, who is neutral on humanity, who will help you if you help him, and who will put himself away from you if you do not. So I think calling it a devil is really kind of an unfair description. It seems to be more of just a being. Now, furthermore, to get into, because of course the Cherokee are a little bit further north than what we're talking about, but to get into more regionally specific creatures, we'd be looking at something known as the Esti Kapkaki. I probably butchered that pronunciation as well, but I'm trying. Um, and this is a seminal tale of what translates to a furry tall man or a hairy giant. Uh, now, it's the term giant is kind of iffy here because in some cases we're talking about something that's 5 to 7 feet tall, and then in some cases we're talking about something that's 9 to 10 feet tall. It seems like there's not total agreement on this, and of course a 5 to 7 foot tall one could be a juvenile, and a 9 to 10 foot tall one could be a full size one. So there's a lot of possibilities going on here. But the idea here is that we're talking about something that resembles a human being, but of immense stature and covered in gray hair that also carries a large wooden club and smells foul. That's about as close as you can get to the skunk ape as, as possible. I mean, that is, it smells bad, it's large, it's hairy, it's humanoid. Um, the club is new, but who knows? And of course, with these stories, it could be that sometime in the distant past, there was a war between two tribes, and we know that we get plenty of stories of very large tribes of human beings, especially in the Americas. There's the giants of Patagonia, there's the Siteka of, uh, of, of the North American continent. So there's a lot of different like giant tribes in Native American folklore, but this seems to be more of a, a Sasquatch kind of deal. And in the American sense, we have a tendency to make anything we don't understand evil, Whereas the Native Americans seem to have had more of an idea that these creatures were peers of ours. That they weren't human, but they also weren't necessarily evil. So the question becomes, you know, do these stories of things like Sasquatch and the uh, Esti Kapkaki and the Tsul Kalu, do these all 
stem from something real? Do they stem from a very ancient tradition of folklore from before the Native American tribes spread out across the continent? Does it stem from a separate, very large tribal group somewhere? We might never know, but at the end of the day, I do think it's fascinating that the skunk ape seems to have roots in the actual local indigenous folklore. And I'm a bit quicker to believe the natives on this one than people may be looking for a newspaper headline written about them. But as always, I would love to know what you guys think. And if you would like to leave a comment and let us know, and if you enjoyed the video, please smash the like button. Like it's, you know, a very good looking skunk ape, I suppose. And then if you're feeling a little tired right now after all this information, well, good news. We've got coffee you can get from Tableau Roasting Co. The link is in our description. We also have an Amazon storefront where you can get books that we like as well as cocktail supplies, coffee supplies, and various other, uh, you know, gifts and things like that that will all support our work. You can also check us out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you can get access to all of our exclusive content, though there are higher tiers that offer prizes as well. We also have a merch store at thelorelodge.shop where you can get stuff that has our logos on it and funny sayings and and finally we actually do have a partnership with Target and I wear a lot of Goodfellow & Co clothes because they are very comfortable currently wearing a pair of their jeans so if you want to get any of the stuff that we like to wear and that I can honestly say is very good quality for a very low price check out that link in our description it is go to Target something um, <laughs> and if you want to check out any of our other stuff our Instagrams our discord that's that stuff that's all in the link tree as well as the discord link which should be in the description on its own but without further ado i'm aiden mattis thanks for stopping by the lord